Beloved in the Lord, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, if you were here last week, you remember that the reading was about how the people of Israel were set free from the clutches of Pharaoh and the Egyptians. The Israelites had lived in Egypt for 400 years after Joseph brought his father and his brothers and the whole clan to live there to escape the famine that was happening in their home country of Canaan. They stayed. The Israelite people were strong and numerous, and soon a new pharaoh came about, and he figured that they were going to overtake Egypt unless something would be done. So he made them work as slaves. At the end of that 400 years, God called Moses to go to Pharaoh and tell him to release his people. Let my people go, said Moses, but Pharaoh responded by saying, no. After all, these people were an important part of the Egyptian economy. Even though God sent plagues on the Egyptians, Pharaoh still refused to let the Israelites go until that last plague which was the slaughter of all the firstborn in the land. The Israelites were spared this last plague, however, because God told them to paint the lintel and the door and the doorposts of their homes with blood from the Passover lamb, and the angel of death would pass over them and do them no harm. Finally, this time Pharaoh had enough. He told them to go, get out of Egypt. But once the people of Israel had left, Pharaoh changed his mind. I'm clicking it. I'm wrong button. There we go. Pharaoh changed his mind and sent his army, including horses and chariots, to overtake them and capture them back. Although we haven't really talked about this during these last weeks, here's an important part of the story. The people had camped near the Red Sea, although it wasn't really red, And as Pharaoh and his army came closer and closer to them, God sent a strong wind from the east to blow the waters away so that the people could cross the sea on foot with a wall of water on either side. I don't know if you can see. Oh, you can. The walls of water are full of sea uh, sea animals and fish. I just love that painting. And you guessed it. The Pharaoh and the, and the Egyptians were after them, and you guessed it, once Pharaoh and his men started to follow them, and the people had reached the other side, the wind stopped, and the waters came crashing down upon the Egyptians, drowning them. So God's people were really free now. While they were in the, in the wilderness, God sent them food in the form of manna, you've maybe heard of that, from which they made bread and quails that they could roast and eat. God also supplied them with water from a rock. Not Iraq, but a rock. (laughs) God took care of them. Soon they traveled onto the Sinai Desert. There we go. Today's reading begins six weeks after Moses climbs up Mount Sinai to meet with the Lord and to receive the commandments and the laws and the rules so that their lives would be ordered as a community. For six weeks, the people were without the man who was their connection to God. So here's the reading. Exodus 32, 1 to 14. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come, Make gods for us, who shall go before us. For as as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. So Aaron said to them, Take off the rings, the gold rings that are on the ears of your wives and your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took the gold from them formed it in a mold, and cast it in an image of a calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, 
He built an altar before it, and Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a festival to the Lord. And they rose early the next day, and they offered burnt offerings and sacrifices of well-being, and the people sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to revel. This was a wild party. The Lord said to Moses, Go down at once. Your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have acted perversely. They have been quick to turn aside from the way that I commanded them. They had cast, have cast for themselves an image of a calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, how stiff-necked they are. Now let me alone so that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them. And of you, I'll make a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord, his God, and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt, with great power and a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath, Change your mind and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, how you swore to them by your own self, saying, I will multiply your descendants like the stars in heaven. And all this land that I have promised, I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord changed his mind about the disaster he planned to bring on his people. The golden calf, actually it was probably a bull, was wrong, a bad idea on so many levels. First of all, Aaron was, jo was Moses' brother, and he'd been with Moses but as, with, as he'd been with Moses as Moses went before Pharaoh those many times. And he'd been there for the plagues and for the escape from Egypt, for the miraculous parting of the Red Sea. And he'd dance for joy with the others when they realized that Pharaoh and the Egyptian army had been swallowed up in the water and would no longer be a threat to them. He ate the manna and the quail that was provided for them through God's providence. He was close to Moses, so you'd think he'd remember that the Lord was the one who did these amazing works. It wasn't Moses. But Aaron, like the other, other Israelites, had lived in Egypt his whole life. He knew that culture, and he knew that the Egyptians worshipped the false god Apis, who was believed to have the form of a bull, and I read about this a little bit yesterday, and they actually, if they would find the right kind of bull with the right kind of markings, that was their God, the actual bull, not just a statue. And when the bull died, they would embalm him like they would embalm the pharaohs, and he had a special place where they would bury him. So the bull would be a familiar God for the people. What I think was most ironic, though, and this is why I asked you about gold, this was possibly the worst part of the whole episode, was the gold from which Aaron cast the bull. When the people came to him saying, come, make gods for us that will go before us, for we have no idea what's happened to this Moses, Aaron asks for their gold jewelry. In Egypt, slaves were forced to wear a gold earring, as identification. When the Israelites fled from Pharaoh, the Egyptians gave them more gold, probably as an incentive for them to leave so that the plagues would stop. So the gold that the Israelites brought to Aaron had come from their slavery. So here's the problem. Not only did Aaron make the statue of the calf or bull, which was a representation of the Egyptian god Apis, but the material he used was gold from their years of bondage. When the people rose up to make sacrifices and to worship this golden calf, 
Doesn't it seem like they were actually worshiping Egypt and their old life? What a slap in the face. To Moses, of course, but more importantly to God. They had forgotten everything that the Lord God, Yahweh, the God of Israel, had done for them. The escape from Egypt, crossing the Red Sea on dry land, the water and the manna and the quail in the desert, they'd forgotten that when they cried out for freedom or fear or hunger or thirst, God responded through mighty and wondrous deeds and works. They had forgotten all that And now they wanted a homemade God that they could see and touch and dance around. I've told you stories before of my favorite, one of my favorite characters. His name is Hilbert. Maybe you remember this past summer I talked to you about Hilbert. Hilbert read from the Bible that Jesus said, go sell your belongings, give everything to the poor, and then come follow me. Hilbert took all of this to heart having a huge garage sale and giving the profits to Reformation Lutheran to build a food pantry in a corner of the women's quilting room and to start a foundation where members could also give money to help those in need. And for the rest of his life, Hilbert was nothing but generous when he was asked for help, often giving under the condition that the gift would be anonymous. In time, however, most folks knew who Anonymous really was. He helped with the expenses for congregational dinners, and he paid for kids to go to camp, and the expenses for VBS treats, and the supplies of snacks and soda for the youth get-togethers. By this time, Hilbert was in his late 80s. He still worked at the pantry, and he was pretty possessive of it. Actually, he was a real neat neck. Neat Nick. Actually, everything needed to be in order and organized perfectly. Well, one year during a Halloween party that the young people were giving for the kids in the neighborhood, a girl and a couple of the guys found a key labeled food pantry, and they decided to have a little fun. They waited until everybody was busy and snuck down the hall to the pantry. They mixed up the carefully organized cans of food and put boxes of crackers in the freezer and boxes of cereal in with the cleaning supplies. They didn't take anything. It was just a prank, you know. When Hilbert found the mess, he got mad. He cleaned it up and reorganized it, and then he stewed about it for days. He was able to figure out when the mischief had occurred and he rightly guessed that it was the young people. He attended their next meeting and let them have it. After he left, the youth leaders told the kids about all the things that Hilbert had done for Reformation Church and for so many other people, how he made sure that every kid who wanted to go to Bible camp could go, how he was the one who supplied their soda and their snacks and their pizzas every week. The three culprits sort of knew who'd helped them go to camp, but they'd forgotten. They stared at the floor, and the girls started to cry. The guys did too. They all felt awful. Back to Mount Sinai. The Lord was still giving the commandments to Moses when God saw what the Israelites were up to. He told Moses he better head back down so he could watch as God destroyed this ungrateful people. I will make of you a great nation, he says to Moses. But Moses pleads with God for the people's sake. Why should the Egyptians have the satisfaction of hearing how the Lord God Yahweh slaughtered the Israelites? And remember, God, remember, you promised Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, your servants, that their descendants would be, would number as the stars in the heavens. Remember God? And the Lord did remember. And the Lord changed his mind about the disaster he'd planned to bring on the people. The people forgot. 
but the Lord remembered and loved them anyway. Of course, Moses had a few things to say about what happened, and he inflicted punishment on the people that was quite creative. But you'll have to read about that in Exodus to find more about it, and I encourage you to do that. Continue reading in chapter 32. Now, Hilbert didn't smile at the young people at church anymore. The kids were upset, but most of them didn't have anything to do because most of them didn't have anything to do with a prank. The three culprits went to the youth leaders and fessed up. Somehow, they said they needed to make things right with Hilbert. Well, Hilbert's 88th birthday was coming up, so they decided to throw a birthday party for him. Balloons and cake and ice cream and cards and silly gifts were all waiting when, when Hilbert came through the door. He tried not to smile when he saw it because he was still kind of mad. But before the party started, the three kids who played the prank said they were sorry for what they did and that they knew about all the good things he did for them They'd just forgotten about it. They thanked him, and he forgave them. Then before the cake and the ice cream, or the cards or the gifts, he took all the kids on a tour of the food pantry, and he told them about the people who needed the food, and about the volunteers, and how hard they worked. He told them how much the pantry depended upon the generosity of the people of the church for donations, And then he asked the kids if anyone wanted to come and help out after school. And he got several takers. He didn't need to hide his smile this time. He grinned from ear to ear. Forgetting and remembering isn't just about remembering to bring home that gallon of milk you forgot to get yesterday. Forgetting can be faithlessness like Aaron and the Israelites. But remembering is about gathering and loving and forgiving and healing and moving forward together, caring about one another. Like Hilbert and the youth group. Remembering. Get it? Members? Remembering. Pulling all the pieces back together in a whole. That's quilted, in case you can't tell. A bunch of pieces put together in the whole of a heart. It's what God does for us, for what, and it's also what we can do for one another. And it sure is beautiful. It's more beautiful than a golden calf, isn't it? Amen.